right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the My Horse University and eExtension Horse Quest live webcast on how to assess a horse's health and welfare. Our presenter for this evening is Dr. Carissa Wickens. Uh, next slide, please. Carissa is an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida and serves as our Extension Equine Specialist. Her current responsibilities are to develop and implement equine education and outreach programs and to conduct applied research in the areas of equine management, behavior, and welfare. Carissa completed her PhD in Animal Science from Michigan State University with an emphasis in horse behavior and welfare. Please note that you're able to ask questions during the presentation using the question and answer option at the top of your screen. We're also going to have time at the end of the presentation for additional questions, and we are also recording this presentation, and it will be available on the My Horse University website. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, Dr. Wiggins. Okay, thank you very much, Gwen. Good evening, everyone. I'm really excited about this presentation this evening. This is a, a great, very important topic. And um, certainly when we talk about equine welfare, there has been quite a few advances in, in our understanding of horses physical as well as psychological needs and how that affects the way in which we manage horses. And it also um, is teaching us a lot about you know, how horses learn and how they respond to different things that we ask them to do in, in everyday routines with our horses, but certainly also as it relates to training and um, using horses for, for recreation and for competition. So again, just very pleased to be with you all to, tonight, and um, we'll go ahead and get started here. So some of the things we'll talk about this evening are definitions of welfare, so what is welfare? as well as an introduction to some key equine welfare principles that, that the goal really this evening is to send you away with some information and things that will be helpful in your everyday work with your own horses at home, but also as you start to engage in conversations about equine welfare with your friends, your neighbors, other horsemen, um, just generally with others in the equine community, but also this is really important when it comes to talking about the general public, um, some of their perceptions of, of how we work with horses and what we do with horses, especially if they're not coming from an animal science or an equestrian background, we do find ourselves being asked questions sometimes and we need to be prepared to explain to the general public in particular why and how we do certain things with horses and how we're, we're trying to strive to understand those horses better and what their needs might be. Um, so we're also going to talk then about assessing horse welfare. How do we assess the horse's welfare? We look at health measures and, and many other things, and so we'll touch on those this evening. And then again, we'll talk about equine welfare science. So what are we learning through equine welfare science research? I'll share some interesting studies with you this evening. And we'll also um, provide you with some equine welfare assessment tools and resources that, again, you'll be able to apply at home. So why is horse welfare important? Um, we've kind of just touched on that briefly, but the public in recent years has become increasingly concerned with how animals are used, cared for, and housed. Um, there's been concern for fairness and humane care. So in terms of fairness, this may be that spectator at the show that might observe something that we do in the show ring or doing something at the fairgrounds with the horses or at the competition with the horses that they may just not have a lot of background in, may not understand, um, and something that is very normal um, and, and very safe and appropriate for the horse, they still may ask about it just because it's not something they're familiar with. Um, in terms of humane care, we certainly, as horse owners and, and managers at farms, we try every day to do our best in the way we care for our animals. That is just part of good husbandry and, and good animal care practices with our horses. But this also starts to stem into um, you know, some of the, the neglect or abuse cases that many of us are familiar with. Um, we see a lot of those concerns expressed you know, through social media as well as just on the newscasts and things like that. So welfare and assessing welfare in horses also comes into play um, for, for folks that may have concerns about the care of horses and certainly with neglect or abuse issues. 
it's really kind of, of neat when you think about the history of, of horses and in particular the, the history of horse-human interactions. The idea of horse welfare and the importance of it really does have a long history, um, despite what some of us might think. And it really stems all the way back to a, a Greek cavalryman, um, Xenophon, and he was considered the father of classical equitation. He actually wrote the first fully preserved manual on the riding horse. It was called The Art of Horsemanship. And in this, this text, he urged readers, in addition to being good horsemen and, and caring for their animals, he really urged the readers to know the horse's psyche, to understand something about the horse's mentality. And we'll talk a little bit about the horse's effective or what we consider the emotional state of the horse a little bit later on in the presentation. But his writings stressed the importance of horse care and handling, as well as understanding the horse. So understanding the behavior and the nature of the horse. So I just think that's really interesting and really important because there's a very long history of that. Also, um, a little bit more recent history. In the mid to late 1800s, many of us, of course, are very familiar with the children's classic Black Beauty. This was a novel written by Anna Sewell. And even though it was considered a children's book, it was really all about a, a moral purpose. Um, Anna Sewell grew up in a town um, in England where it was very customary to take horse-drawn carriages to and from um, work and, and to business and to the market and, and so forth. And as a child kind of growing up in this environment and watching the, the care and the treatment of these, these carriage horses, she wanted to write kind of from the horse's perspective into this story some ideas as it related to um, kindness and sympathy and having an understanding of the treatment of horses and, and how they should be treated. So it ended up having a, a deeper meaning, and many of us appreciate this book as sort of an early work that was attributed to some of the practices that maybe weren't um, quite, quite so you know, perceived as, as being really fair to the horse back then. So this book in particular was said to have an, an inter instrumental effect in abolishing the practice of using the check rein in which the horse's head was checked really high and tightly for the majority of the day. Um, so this was again something that was sort of early in history looking at the care and treatment of horses. So let's then talk about what is animal welfare. Um, you know, how would we define the term welfare when we're talking about animals in general, or certainly for the purpose of this evening's presentation, we're focusing in on horses. Animal welfare acknowledges the use of animals under humane conditions. So this would certainly um, include animals that are kept as livestock for production purposes. It includes our pets or companion animals and also animals that we keep for recreation. So under this definition, you know, animal welfare acknowledges that we are using these animals, but then we have a responsibility to care for and treat those animals as, as best we can. Again, keeping in mind that they have certain needs and we need to meet those needs. The other definition um, that, that some people, I, I feel like when we talk about animal welfare, some people get concerned and, and you'll run into some opposition or some challenges in discussing animal welfare because the other sort of swing to this or, or other philosophy behind this is animal rights. Um, animal rights refers to animals having the same kind, kinds of rights as humans, but under this philosophy or theory, basically these folks believe that animals should not be used for any purpose. So welfare is not the same thing. And so I just wanted to point these two definitions out animal welfare versus animal rights, um, two pretty different theories or philosophies in that with animal welfare, we are having relationship with these animals, we are utilizing these animals, but making sure that we are giving them optimum care. So a little bit about, um, a little bit more about animal welfare definitions. I'm going to talk with you a little bit about the three concepts of welfare. And we basically present these as sort of three overlapping circles. And so the first circle I've brought up here is basic health and functioning. So in this definition of welfare or concept of welfare, 
This is some work um, and some and theory that was developed by Donald Broom at the University of Cambridge. And in this definition, the welfare of an animal is its state as regards to its attempts to cope with its environment. The animal may fail to cope in that its fitness is reduced and either it dies or it fails to grow or its ability to reproduce is reduced in some direct way. So under this circle of basic health and functioning, it's really focusing on the animal's fitness, its ability to, to grow and function and to reproduce and so forth. So it's really kind of focusing on the basic health and functioning or physiological functioning of the animal. The other circle then, um, the second circle, is considered natural living. So this concept of welfare is not only concerned with basic health and functioning, but it takes it a step further kind of into this separate or different concept. But you can start to see that there's a little bit of overlap that's shown here, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So in this definition, this is from Bernard Rowland in the early 1990s, his definition of welfare is not only will welfare mean control of pain and suffering, it will also entail nurturing and fulfillment of the animal's natures. So natural living is considering what the animal in a natural setting or basically a, a free-ranging or feral setting would, would do. What are its normal repertoires of behavior and is it allowed to perform those behaviors? So again, the animal's natures. The third circle shown here is what we consider affective state or the emotional state of the animal. And this one in particular of the three concepts or three definitions of welfare is really probably the most challenging and also the most exciting because this is an area that we are finally able to, to really look at this um, objectively through some of the newer research methodologies and, and some of the studies that are being performed currently. So here, um, this is a, a thought and a definition from Ian Duncan, also in the early 1990s. This is defined as neither health nor lack of stress nor fitness is necessary and or sufficient to conclude that an animal has good welfare. Welfare is dependent on what the animal feels. So the affective state is dealing with trying to assess or better understand the animal's feelings, which again, they can't talk to us, so that is probably the most challenging part but um, we're making some advances in this area. Just another, another thought here from Marion Stamp Dawkins. Um, animal welfare involves the subjective feelings of animals. It is a concern that some of the ways in which humans treat other animals cause mental suffering and that these animals may experience sensations or emotions such as pain, boredom, frustration, hunger, and other unpleasant states. So it's the understanding that the animal is capable of experiencing negative or, or positive emotions or states, and you know, how do we assess that? How do we, how do we get at that? And is it important to assuring a level of welfare for the horse? And certainly I think we all agree that this is an important aspect. So again, what is animal welfare? There's these three circles that overlap. So again, the three concepts are basic health and functioning, natural living, and effective state. And depending on which we place the most importance or emphasis on depends a lot on our own experiences and background as we've worked with horses um, and as we continue to work with horses. And for example, even depending on what discipline we're, we're working in or what type of job or position we hold within the equine industry, these viewpoints can, can differ. But again, my main point here is that these three are concepts of welfare that are all important and you can see with the overlap that you know essentially we try to come up with welfare solutions or assessing solutions that really address these multiple views. So the other aspect here is what we call the five freedoms of animal welfare. So the current form of these five freedoms were proposed by the Farm Animal Welfare Council in the United Kingdom and these are really um, key, key aspects to what is animal welfare, how do we define that, and, and how do we assess it. So the five freedoms are freedom from hunger or thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, or disease, freedom to express most of the animal's normal behaviors, and freedom from fear and distress. So if we think back to the three circles or the three concepts of welfare, 
there is some overlap, and, and these two things really go together very nicely. Um, and they really provide the, the essential framework for considering um, topics and, and issues in, in horse welfare. So for example, I have in blue text here, freedom from hunger or thirst, and freedom from injury or disease. Those would really go well with or, or fall within that first blue circle, basic um, health and functioning. The text in orange, so freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, and freedom from fear and distress, those fall within the orange circle, which is the effective state of the animal. And then normal behavior, the freedom of the animal to express most of their normal behavior or nature, would certainly fall into the green circle, which was identified as natural, natural living. So again, our viewpoints might differ, but some of these things um, you know, certainly overlap. And some examples would be, you know, we can, we can assure health of the horse. If we have a good herd health management program, we're deworming the horse, we're having regular or routine hoof care done, we're giving them some exercise, you know, we're making sure that they are functioning, that they are biologically healthy and sound, you know, that mostly falls into that, that first circle, the basic health and functioning. But if we also provide turnout and let them socialize with other horses, then we're also within that natural living circle. And then the effective state, you know, we can pay attention to things like how much the horse vocalizes when they're separated from other horses. We can, um, and I'll, I'll present some research to you this evening that shows a little bit again how we're looking at, you know, how the horse is perceiving its environment and, and what effects are some of our management or training techniques or schemes, you know, having for that horse and how do we get at that. And again, that one's a little bit more challenging, but all three are important to consider. So a little bit of a, a question, and I realize um, since we, we aren't talking together live tonight, it's a little bit hard to, to do this, but I present these two pictures. And as we've just talked about the three concepts of welfare and the five freedoms, I want you to just take a few seconds to look at the top picture and the bottom lower left picture. We have horses in two very different situations, but just take a few seconds and just see as it relates to those concepts of welfare, if you can kind of think about, you know, how would you start or, or go about assessing the welfare of these horses in these two different settings? So I think at first glance, there's many of us that would look at the lower picture on the lower left of the two horses together in that very lush, long grass pasture with a nice shade tree there. Um, it looks like a very nice facility. That right from get-go is very aesthetically pleasing. There's two horses together. They have the opportunity for turnout and they have the opportunity for grazing because there is enough forage there to actually meet that, that foraging need or, or desire that, that natural grazing behavior. So, you know, we can look at effective state or think about, you know, for the horse, you know, which situation is potentially better. And again, that's, that's fairly hard to measure. It's probably easier to look at both of these pictures and look at the horses in, in each image. We can look at the condition of these horses, so we can look at their hair coat, we can look over their body and see if we see any you know, over injuries, scrapes, those kinds of things. Um, you know, we can look at their, well, we'll talk about this in a minute, but we can look at their body condition score. So the condition of these animals, how much fat covering is on these animals. And I think that we would all be in pretty good agreement that none of the animals pictured seem to be in a poor state of welfare in terms of health. But compared to the lower picture, if we look at this horse by himself, you know, then we start thinking about natural living. So is this horse given opportunities to socialize? Is there grass or forage there for that horse to eat? We can see on the ground that it looks like there's some remnants of some hay. So obviously this horse is being provided with feed and forage. Um, the look of the pasture in the back, this may also be late fall, early winter. So it's just kind of the condition of the grass behind this horse. There's also health reasons why a horse may be kept on a dry lot. If they're a really easy keeper, if they've had history of laminitis, um, maybe we want to restrict their calorie intake. Maybe in the winter we just want to keep them off the pasture so that we're not damaging the grass. So there's all different reasons why these horses might be in these particular contexts or situations. So part of welfare assessment is looking at the big picture 
and looking at, you know, certainly if we have multiple animals on a farm, we may not just be looking at the individual's welfare, but looking at them as a, as a small population or as a group of animals and, and starting to think about those three concepts of welfare and what needs might be met and where we might be lacking. So how do we go about assessing welfare? What kinds of indicators can we use to assess whether a horse or a group of horses is experiencing a good state of welfare or a poor state of welfare? So there are several things that we can use and that we do use and that are being researched as part of equine welfare science. We do look at behavioral indicators, physiological indicators, there's also biological indicators, as well as immunological indicators. And I'll explain each of these in the next few slides. So in terms of behavioral indicators of welfare, what are we talking about here? We certainly use natural horse behavior, which our best example of how horses behave naturally or what normal behavior looks like in horses, our best example are studies um, observing feral or free ranging horses because in those populations, they are of course unmanaged. So when we're looking at social interaction and social structure, um, normal or natural grazing and feeding behavior, those are some of our best examples of what we know to be sort of true of, of the ethology or the nature of the horse in terms of their behavioral uh, repertoires. But in terms of you know, behavior, we can look at things like vocalization, the social interaction. We can also look at fear responses, that fight or flight response that we see in horses as they react to stimuli or different experiences. Also, again, foraging and grazing. So we know how important that is and how much time horses spend each day grazing. It can be as much as 16 to 17 hours a day if they're out on pasture and, and allowed to do that. Um, so those are very important sort of natural behaviors that we look at and can turn to for some indication of welfare. We also then will observe abnormal behaviors. So are abnormal behaviors present? And if they are, how frequently do they occur? And what type of abnormal behavior? Um, so I, I kind of use the abnormal behavior term a little bit loosely here. Underneath, I'm really talking more about stereotypic behaviors, but abnormal behaviors may also be things like abnormal aggression, abnormal aggression towards other horses, abnormally um, high levels of aggression to, to humans, um, Abnormal behavior can also be changes in behavior. So a horse that's generally very friendly and, and affable and a good performer, if their behavior shifts, that might be an indication that there's a suboptimal environment or maybe that horse is experiencing pain or some other kind of stress. But here I list things like stereotypic behaviors, such as stall walking, cribbing, and weaving. And so in the past, stereotypies have been used as a welfare indicator. But part of the challenge there is that, you know, some of us that own or have managed or worked with stereotypic behavior horses, those horses come to a farm with a lot of history often. Um, it may not be that current environment or current owner that, that is the cause of the stereotypic behavior. That horse may have already had previous history that's created those behaviors, and now we've inherited those behaviors once they're already established. Um, we have some, some webcasts and some other resources available on stereotypic behaviors, so I, I'm not going to cover a lot of that in this talk tonight, but I can certainly take some questions at the end about stereotypies. Behavioral responses to illness or pain. Um, you know, if a horse, basically if their appetite changes, if they decrease their feed intake, if you find them, you know, having posture changes, they start to favor a limb or tread their limbs, you know, tread their feet back and forth frequently having a dull or listless appearance, um, you know, especially in a box stall where the horse just seems withdrawn and is staring at the wall. It's not reacting to stimuli or events around the barn and in its environment. Those can all be re behavioral responses to, to illness or pain or generally to chronic stress in some cases. So those are all things to take note of also, and all of these are examples of behavioral indicators of welfare. So what about physiological indicators of welfare? There's several, and one of the things that just on a routine basis we, we like to do in terms of checking the, the health status of the horse, and again, health directly plays into welfare. It falls within that first circle, basic health and functioning. Some of the things we should get used to doing on a routine basis are taking horses' vital signs. 
This is something that your veterinarian will do. This is something that many of our horse owners learn to do because once you understand what the normal range is for heart rate, respiration, temperature are for your horse, and the more you monitor their health and behavior, the, the quicker and more effective you are in identifying problems. So whether again, it's illness or a pain response, then you can work with your vet to diagnose and, and you know, put together the, the proper treatment plan quickly. But heart rate, respiration, temperature, um, other vital signs include looking at the mucous membranes on the horse. So going to the horse's gums and looking for a, a nice moist, pale pink um, in color gums. Um, you know, heart rate in a resting horse, an adult horse, it should be around 28 to 40 beats per minute. Respiration is usually eight to 16 breaths per minute. And temperature at rest in an adult horse is around 99 and a half to about 101 degrees. So again, understanding what the normal ranges are and taking those periodically on your horse when your horse is feeling healthy and is behaving normally, that can help you keep records and assess that when all of a sudden there are changes. Looking again at feed and water intake. So again, we know that if horses aren't feeling well, if they're stressed, if they're in pain, if they're sick, they will back off on their feed and water consumption. Um, and then of course that can create a whole another host of problems, especially if they're not drinking well. Um, we can have issues with colic and, and some other health concerns, dehydration for example. So monitoring intake is also important and that is considered a physiological indicator. We can also think about and then assess horses' responses to certain stressors. And I have just a list here of some of the common stressors that horses experience. And many of these are fairly common and routine in the everyday life of a horse, or at least on a fairly frequent basis throughout the year for any horse. Um, certainly if we're talking about broodmares and foals, if we have a breeding operation, a natural process is to, to wean that foal so that we can start working with that young horse, put them into training, um, be able to separate them or, or at least put them in a group of similar aged horses to feed them appropriately. There's all reasons for, for actually weaning the horses, but we know that that is a stressor to the foal and, and a stressor to the mare. So we can think about and, and talk a little bit about how we might reduce some of that stress with some different weaning methods or, or weaning techniques. Farrier and veterinary work. Um, this is an interesting one. I mean, obviously horses can get stressed during these procedures, um, but certainly we can argue that without routine hoof care, trimming, and veterinary work, herd health, vaccination, and deworming programs, then we start to have reductions in, in the level of welfare for those animals. And again, that goes back to that biological health and functioning circle. We can have horses with injuries, um, limited feed availability or limitations of other resources. If horses are kept in isolation, um, you know, they're not able to, to socialize or interact with other horses. We know that that can be detrimental to welfare. Um, showing and trail riding, you know, again, we use these horses for pleasure and recreation and we, we really enjoy that and that's something that, that also is part of the, the horse-human interaction. But we can argue that especially if a horse is going to a showgrounds for the first time, transporting that horse, being in an environment that's new, maybe being separated from herd mates back home, all of those things can induce stress. But they are routine practices and they're things that we do with our horses. But the, the key thing there is there are ways to mitigate some of the stress and to prepare horses for these procedures. Physiological indicators, um, specifically some of the things that we can measure in horses to give us some um, sense of, of what type of welfare or what level of welfare they're experiencing. We can measure cortisol. Cortisol is the hormone produced by the adrenal gland, so it is considered a stress hormone. It's secreted when an animal experiences a stressor, and cortisol also acts within the body to increase blood pressure, it mobilizes fats and glucose for quick use by the horse, and it also can aid in reducing allergic reaction and reduces inflammation. So cortisol has a role to play in the body. The problem comes in where we have you know, chronic stress situations. If horses experience prolonged increased cortisol secretion, this can actually suppress the immune system. 
We can measure cortisol um, in horses by taking blood samples. Um, we also have some more non-invasive ways that, that we're utilizing now to study stress response, looking at cortisol, so we can actually collect saliva samples from horses. And we can also measure cortisol or cortisol metabolites in the urine or the feces of the horse. So that's become really, really key because we don't have to do the blood draw. We don't actually have to stick the horse in the jugular vein to draw the blood sample, which can also induce you know, a stress response. So we've got these great ways now that we can measure and understand all of this a little bit better with, with also making it just less invasive and, and much easier for the horse. Heart rate and or heart rate variability, which we call HRV. These are other physiological indicators. Um, heart rate variability is, is a little bit more difficult to explain and, and understand, but it's used in conjunction with heart rate, but it basically shows the, the fight or flight response of the horse. And so if a horse is stressed, typically we'll see increases in heart rate, and we'll also see changes or differences in heart rate variability. And the heart rate variability is just measuring the variation in that beat to beat interval. So these are two measures that are sometimes used alone or more often I'm seeing them used in conjunction with one another to again be a measure of stress and, and how the horse is responding to different things. So this is an example. This is a study that was done um, both with horses in, in Michigan actually and then a second part of the study was carried out with young horses in France. This was a, a visiting researcher, a grad student that came to Michigan State University when I was a student there. Um, she was looking at some different methods of weaning foals from their, their dam. And so at the time of separation from the mare, they, they had these horses put into two different groups. One of the groups of foals was what we call a pure weaned group. So these babies were put in a group together with foals of similar age. All of these babies were weaned about four to five months of age. And so the peer weaned group was just with other literally peers, um, same age foals. And then we have this adult weaned group. And the adult weaned group was a group of babies that were put out in the Michigan farm. They were put out with two older mares who had maternal experience. They had had foals before. And the, the larger group of horses, the, the second part of the study that was conducted in France, was actually looking at this group of babies put out with an older mare as well as an older gelding, just to eliminate the effect of, of it having been only female adult horses. So they wanted to also see what the gelding um, had, had an influence or not. So in this study, in this graph here, they were measuring salivary cortisol. So as a measure of stress response, they were using salivary cortisol as a physiological indicator. And we can see here at the time of weaning, it says weaning with the arrow pointed there towards the, the data here. And we actually see the adult weaned group, that's the solid line, throughout the study, throughout the behavior and the physiological observations in this study, they showed that the salivary cortisol response in that group of babies that was adult weaned group was lower than the pure weaned group. So just having kind of a, a surrogate adult horse in the group of babies seemed to reduce some of the stress, at least as indicated by salivary cortisol. And again, in this study, they also looked at locomotion of the babies. They, they counted the frequency of vocalizing from the foals. And so they were using behavioral and physiological indicators together to, to look at this, this question of whether or not we could reduce some of the stress at weaning by providing um, adults in the group of babies. This graph shows heart rate response of a horse to transport. This was a mare that we actually had in the teaching herd at University of Delaware when I was on faculty there a few years ago. This was a mare that had never left the farm and she was fairly new to, to trailer loading. She had been loaded on a trailer a few times before but had never actually been transported off the farm. So this was a study, I, I had a few of our undergraduate students in, in the program do kind of a, a mini, just a little pilot test looking at using either negative or positive reinforcement. So positive reinforcement consisted of clicker training and, and training the horses to actually touch a target and using the target to help get the horse on the trailer and then transporting the horses around the farm for about a 10 minute ride just on the property of the farm. 
or negative reinforcement, which was just using halter pressure, pressure and release of the halter to get the horse to, to walk up the ramp and enter the trailer. So it was a little bit about differences in, in um, how we trained the horses, but ultimately what this shows is that for this mare in particular, you look at her heart rate data and you see a, a peak about between zero and five minutes of, of data collection here with the heart rate monitor, and you see this fairly large peak. That was about the time that the trailer actually started in motion, and you can see that her heartbeat went from around 110, 115 beats per minute up to almost 180 beats per minute, which if we equate that to how high the heart rate gets in a horse associated with exercise, it was actually following in, into that moderate intensity level. So flight or fight response was, was basically an action here as it related to transport, and it's just another um, physiological indicator using heart rate to, to measure that stress response. What about biological indicators of welfare? What are we talking about here? This gets into what we would consider production measures. And you know, in other livestock species, swine, beef cattle, dairy cattle, we can look at things like average daily gain. We can look at um, milk production in, in dairy cattle and, and how the management and what we're doing to those animals and how it impacts those biological or production measurements. In horses, um, that's not so much certainly what, what we're utilizing horses for. They are pleasure and recreation and competition animals. So some of the, the biological indicators that we're gonna talk about really focus on um, the purpose of, of the horse. So certainly if we're looking at reproduction or growth, that would relate to our brood mares and our young growing horses. So foals, yearlings, um, you know, the, the younger horses, we can use growth as an indicator. But in most of our horses, what we're talking about as a biological indicator would be body condition. So assessing the body condition of the horse, looking at body weight and changes in body condition and weight can be very useful indicators of, of welfare. Is that horse in overall good health and condition? We can also look at general attitude in our horses. So an example of this um, would be when we've got that generally friendly horse that suddenly becomes maybe aggressive. Um, this could be when we're grooming or when we're tacking up or riding. It could be a horse that suddenly changes its attitude or behavior towards others in the group. So when this horse is turned out, all of a sudden they're just really, um, you know, going after another horse or group of horses. And these shifts in attitude or changes in behavior would certainly be an, an indicator that they are not functioning normally. Um, it, again, a, a biological indicator of welfare. In horses then, we can also look at performance, but this can be difficult to quantify. It may be a little easier with um, disciplines like racing or endurance, only because we can look at um, racing times or racing results as an indicator. Um, you know, for our, our show ring horses, our, our showing horses, changes in their show ring performance it might be very subtle, um, but that could indicate some issues with welfare, particularly if we're seeing those changes over a period of time and if they start to progress to a point um, where they, they're not subtle anymore that we're really noticing these. It could be an indication of something wrong. One thing I'll say though is just like people, horses can have what we would consider a bad day. Um, but again, if it's a frequent occurrence, it may indicate a problem, and especially if it becomes more frequent and more intense. So body condition scoring. Um, this is something that we certainly encourage all horse owners to, to be familiar with and to get in the practice of, of doing this periodically with your own horse or horses. Um, it's a, a tool that I'll actually um, show you. There's, there's some great tools and some smartphone apps now that can help you do this and not only help you learn how to body condition score, but also as a, as a record keeping method. Um, so you can actually take pictures and, and assess your horse's body condition and monitor that throughout the seasons and over time. So with body condition scoring as a biological indicator, we're looking at six key areas of the horse's body, along the neck, along the withers, behind the horse's shoulder, across the horse's ribs, up over the loin, or what we call the, the crease of the back, and along the horse's tail head. 
This is a numeric scoring system, and it is on a scale of one to nine, with one being poor. This is an animal that's extremely emaciated, all the way up to the high end of the scale, which is a nine. A horse that receives a body condition score nine is extremely fat. So on these horses, there'll be an obvious crease down the back, there'll be patchy fat up over the ribs, along the ribs, um, fat along the inner thighs. So when this horse moves, you may actually see the, the thighs of the horse rubbing together. On the low end of the scale, these are our poor conditioned animals. Um, these animals, you can kind of think about these horses, literally you see almost all of the skeletal structure, especially in those body condition score one and two horses. Um, so these are the horses that a lot of our ag law enforcement, um, animal services, staff members, um, you know, these are the horses that they're getting calls on and are often having to respond to cases involving horses that are, are malnourished, underfed, not getting the resources they need. And of course, they, they lose body condition to a point where they're at this low end of the scale. Our ideal, um, where we like to see our horses, is in the moderate part of the scale. So Basically, we want our horses at a body condition score five to six. Some of our elite athletic horses, um, horses that are in race training or are currently racing, sometimes um, you know polo horses that are high goal, really competitive polo horses, um, those horses might be closer to a, a body condition score four, four and a half. They have a tucked up appearance, they have good muscling, you might see, um, slightly see a little bit of their rib. So they're a little bit on the thinner side, but they're still within that moderate range. And it's not uncommon to see those highly athletic horses look a little bit on that leaner side. I think a lot of us are fairly used to seeing horses that are on the more fleshy side of the scale. Um, and I, I think that can be a challenge because as we become more accustomed to seeing horses on the higher end, those sevens and eights, you know, maybe for some of us, if that's our experience, then we see those fours and fives, and, and maybe that looks very different to us. Um, but again, we can have horses that are on that high end of the, the body condition score scale that are also a concern in terms of health and welfare, because if they're gaining too much weight and they've got excessive fat, they're taking in too many calories and not expending those calories, they can have metabolic issues that can be harder on their joints and on their feet. Um, so it's also a concern from a welfare perspective if they're too fat. So again, this just shows an example of a horse that would be considered um, thin. This is a body condition score of maybe two and a half to three. You guys can clearly see the ribs on this horse. You can see some of the, the shoulder or the scapula structure. There is not much top line or fat covering over the, the withers and the loin of this horse or the tail head. So this would be a, a definitely a, a horse on the thinner side. The horse on the bottom right, this would be considered ideal. This horse would score a five on the Henneke body condition score scale. And again, to some of us, this may actually look pretty lean, but this is considered ideal. Um, but again, anywhere between basically a, a four and a half and that six is considered that moderate and is more where we want to see our horses. So the last indicator that I'm going to say a few words about is immunological indicators. So again, this, this really does tie back into health, but it is considered sort of its, its own indicator because there are some specific parameters or, or things that we can look at here. So I mentioned already that with chronic stress, high levels of cortisol, we can see suppression of the horse's immune system. So this makes them more susceptible to disease. So immunological measures include incidence of disease. So are these horses showing signs of disease, you know, more susceptible to infections? Are they getting sick more frequently? And also we can look at fluctuations in white blood cell counts or parameters. So for example, we can look at the ratio of, you know, different white blood cells to, to others in the blood. Um, you know, we can just look at whether white blood cell counts are elevated or low and so forth. And that can be some indication of, of poor or reduced welfare. So when we talk with others about welfare, um, one of the places that we can begin and that we really probably should begin is helping, especially our, our new horse owners, those that are new to the equine industry, helping them understand their responsibilities that come with ownership and management. 
you know, we should all understand something about the horse's nutritional needs so that we can feed them and provide them feed resources appropriately, make sure that we're meeting their needs, keeping them in good condition, providing adequate foot care and grooming, making sure that we're familiar with common horse diseases and parasites and how we can work together with our veterinarians to make sure that we have good health protocols and, and good vaccine, vaccination and deworming protocols in place to reduce the chance of, of that horse catching a disease, um, having horse health issues. Also being familiar with signs of lameness, pain, and distress. But again, this starts to create some challenges. One of the things that's becoming really important in assessing welfare, though, is, you know, we look at the horse's posture and we can also start to use horse facial expressions, um, how they hold their body, how they're positioning their ears, what does their overall um, demeanor appear to look like. So the pictures I have here, you know, I think we could all agree that the horse shown here with its handler, this horse has her ears forward, she has a bright alert expression, she seems relaxed, she seems alert, um, you know, fairly content. The horse on the right, this horse here is actually an Arabian gelding that had a really deep hoof abscess, and you can see a little bit of the, the vet there checking him and, and starting to, to dig a little bit away at that abscess to open that and to drain that and to treat that. And I think if you guys focus in and just look at this horse's face, you can see the ear position. The ear position is back, not flattened against his head, but it's back and stiff. You can see tension around this horse's eye, above the eye and around the eye itself. You can also see this horse's muzzle and the nostrils kind of tense and tightened, and his lip is very tight. So I, I think, again, if we look at the horse's facial expression here, we could certainly agree that this horse does not look comfortable. This would be a fairly indicative facial expression of a pain response. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. So what I wanted to do also this evening is just very quickly present some of the research that's helping provide some additional insight into not only how we can assess welfare, but what actually matters to the horse and how can we start to figure that out in a way that then we can incorporate into our management and, and help us do that. And the cool part about this, I think really is that as horsemen and women, we already have a good background in this and we know things that relate to that natural behavior. So again, increasing forage for horses, giving them time to socialize and be horses is a big part of what a horse is. It's, it's a big part of their behavior. But it's really exciting to see research that backs this up so that, again, we can help educate and actually make sure that we are doing these things daily with our horses. So this was a study um, by Ben Hajali et al. back in 2009. But this was a study looking at providing horses with foraging opportunities. And specifically, they compared two groups of horses, one that had access to hay basically ad libitum the whole time and another group that was more restricted fed with forage. And they were wanting to use this as a crucial criteria for horse welfare. So what other things could they measure to assess how this impacted the horse's welfare? So in this study, they had 100 Arabian mares. They divided it, this, this group of 100 horses into two groups of 50 horses each. And these mares were allowed to forage on hay um, one group was kept on a dry lot with hay hung up in hay nets. So for um, basically most of the day they were turned out on this dry lot but had ad libitum access to hay in the hay nets. The other group of 50 mares was kept on the dry lot but did not have access to hay. They were only fed in their stalls in the morning and then again in the evening. So while they were out on the paddock, they were not given access to hay. These horses were observed for a total of 6,000 minutes. And the behaviors that were measured were used to put together a time budget. So basically, of all the time the horses were observed, they could measure the, the duration of time spent eating and socializing, and there was a couple other behaviors that they measured. So in the experimental group, this was considered the horse, the, the group of horses, the group of mares that had ad libitum access to hay in the hay nets. 
They were shown to spend more time feeding, which of course does make sense. They had more hay in front of them throughout the day when they were standing in the paddock. But they also, in the behavior observations, they found that they spent less time alert standing and a lower time total spent in locom locomotion, so pacing or walking around the, the paddock. They also observed more positive social interactions. Um, they saw things like more social grooming and just more time with the mares interacting with one another. Um, generally, they described this as more time bonding between the mares in the group that had ad libitum hay access. So some conclusions from this study using behavioral indicators primarily, um, they saw increased vigilance and locomotion in the non-foraging group, which could be an indicator of more stress associated with the lack of, of forage access. They also um, talked about you know, giving mares the opportunity to forage seemed to lead to more positive, normal social interactions between the mares. And one of the, the take home messages here was that, you know, in addition to forage, it might be possible to use other paddock enrichments that could mimic this effect similar to enrichment used in captive zoo environments. So primate exhibits, other exhibits in zoos, you know, they, they work really hard to try to provide environmental enrichment and it really has an influence on, on the animal's behavior. So providing access to forage seemed to have some positive benefits for the horses in terms of welfare. This study is very interesting. Um, you know, generally when we think of, of horses, we, we observe our horses engaging in games of halter tag, we see horses play, and most of us consider play an indicator uh, really of good welfare. If horses are playing, to us, you know, that probably means that they are socially interacting, they are, um, you know, able to express some, some play and natural behavior, and especially in young horses, juvenile horses, Play is also very important to their, their survival skills. They learn how to interact with one another. They learn about the dominance hierarchy. They learn, um, you know, if it's a cult, they'll learn some sexual play behavior through, through playing with mom. Those kinds of things are very important. So we know that play is an important part of welfare, especially for young horses. But this study looked at this in a little different way. So one of the things they mention is that when we look at and study feral or free ranging horses, Play behavior is essentially absent in, a, in adult horses, um, but in our adult domestic horses, we do see play. And so we were trying to, to design an experiment, design a study to evaluate this, you know, why do we see play in domestic horses, but not so much in adult wild horses? So in this study, um, they looked at 29 adult French saddlebred horses from a riding school, and they recorded play behaviors in one hour sessions. And this was a mix of, of geldings and mares in this study. And they described play behavior as head, neck, or chest biting, collective running, so where the horse would kind of gallop and, and just kind of move with the group around the paddock. Um, that's also um, pursuit behavior and also just kick threats. And so they weren't flattening their ears, but it's kind of where the horses would kind of back up to one another and lift up a foot or, or kind of kick at the other horse and then kind of run off. So a couple different play type behaviors that they were looking at. Um, I should mention too, these, these horses were um, between the ages of seven and 17. And in this study, the horses in the riding school um, worked on average four to six hours a week in a riding lessons program um, where teens and adults were, were the, the riding clients and they were anywhere from novice to advanced riders. So the results of this study, um, they actually showed that a smaller percentage of mares played than geldings. They don't have any stallion data because no stallions were included in this particular study, um, but it was interesting to see some sex differences in play behavior. The horses that were categorized with higher stress levels were observed playing more. And so the ways they measured stress, they did look at cortisol, they looked at heart rate, they looked at um, sort of almost what they would consider signs of depression, so that withdrawal behavior or just kind of standing idle in their stalls during the day, looking at the wall, not very reactive to stimuli. They looked at several different behaviors and basically put together a total stress index and then associated that or compared that with the play behavior. And so the horses that were categorized with those higher stress levels were observed to play more. They engaged in more frequent play. 
The horses that liked to play tended to act more aggressively towards humans. Um, those horses showed at least one more aggressive type interaction with, with the human handler. Um, so that was, that was kind of an interesting finding from this study as well. And another interesting part of the study is in all the behavior observations, they did look at stereotypic behavior. And they found, um, you know, in both groups of horses, the, the players and, and sort of horses that tended not to play as much, there was a high proportion of stereotypic behaviors in both groups. So they didn't find a significant difference in play behavior um, associated with stereotypic behavior. So whether they were cribbers or weavers, stall walkers, you know, some were, were stereotypic behavior horses that played a lot, and some of the stereotypic behavior horses didn't play as much. So we're not really sure what that means from this particular study, but I think it's interesting. Um, you know, both play and stereotypic behavior might be an outlet for horses if they are experiencing a higher level of stress. When they're turned out in the paddock, it may provide some activity, it may provide some stimulation, in an otherwise stressful or maybe some optimal environment. But stereotypic behavior and the performance of stereotypies like cribbing weaving are also thought to play some function or role in alleviating stress and alleviating um, a barren environment for horses. So it's kind of interesting, um, that, that result as well. So overall conclusions from this study, um, stressed animals may display more play behaviors to escape their stress. That was one of the conclusions that they drew from this, this paper. Play behavior may be a useful indicator of stressed horses or horses in physical pain, and this warrants further investigation. One of the other things they actually looked at in these riding school horses, they had um, a veterinarian, a, a professional, come in and assess um, lumbar pain. So they were actually looking at spinal pain in these horses, and there was some association between horses that were showing pain response in their backs and the play behavior, um, so that was also very interesting. Play behavior may help horses cope with an unfavorable life um, conditions or environment. So again, a very important study, but a little bit different take on this because again, we usually think of play in terms of positive welfare. This might indicate that play is being used to alleviate a, a stressful situation. So almost an indicator um, in the opposite direction that it may be an indicator of more reduced welfare. Another thing that several um, researchers and, and scientists and practitioners are, are working towards, especially in the United Kingdom, is this qualitative assessment of ridden horse behavior. So when horses are in training, when they're ridden under saddle, are there certain behaviors that might be indicative of um, you know, their response to equipment or the way they're being ridden or the way they're being trained? So we can look at, again, body posture. We can look at their mouth and, and their structure um, of, of their mouth and their tongue and things that they do with their head and their mouth as they're being ridden with a certain type of bridle or bit. And so if we can develop this category of behaviors, what we call this ethogram of ridden horse behaviors, and then look at that in conjunction with some of these other indicators we've been talking about tonight, some of the, the cortisol response, the heart rate, we can start to better understand and maybe have some criteria for sitting back and looking at these horses and understanding how our style of riding or how the equipment or how the training techniques are affecting these horses. And I think that's a great next step, step and a really important step as it relates to, to assessing welfare in horses and making some improvements or some changes in the way that we do things. So the last thing I wanna talk about is giving you all some tools and some resources that relates specifically to equine welfare assessment. So one of the things we talked about this evening was body condition scoring in horses. And we actually do have a, a separate previous webcast that focuses on body condition. And I think it does introduce the eExtension Horses Body Condition Scoring app. Um, information about the app is also available on the eExtension Horses website. But this is a, a smartphone app. It's available through iTunes and Google Play. And it's pictured here on the uh, left lower side of the screen. But this is an app that when it's downloaded on your phone, it has both a learn and a score feature. And the learn feature walks through each of the nine levels um, or, or nine 
numbers on the, the Henneke body condition score scale. So you can go from a one to a nine and it actually shows an image or an example of what a one, two, three, four, all the way up to a nine horse looks like. It also talks about how you go about scoring the horse as well as why body condition scoring is important. In the score feature then, it actually allows you to take a picture of your horse or of the horse that you want a condition score. It captures that image. It will date stamp that image. So the idea is that you can score that animal. So you do the scoring yourself, but you can score the animal based on assessing each of those six areas of the horse's body. So you can give the loin, the ribs, the tail head, the withers, the neck and the shoulder a score, and then it will calculate the overall score. So it'll basically average that out across those six areas of the body. Um, then it archives that score, and there is a desktop version of this app. So once you've collected your horse's data or, or horses at your farm's data, you can go into the desktop app and recall those horses that have been recorded. And then you can actually, there's a print icon within the desktop version, and it allows you to even print that information. But it's a great tool. This has also been really helpful for ag law enforcement. We've been sharing this app and presenting this to some of our ag deputies in the state of Florida um, through our ag law enforcement training program. We talk a lot about equine welfare assessment and, and how to respond to neglect cases. And the body condition score app, I think, is proving really helpful, especially the learn feature because if they need a quick reference of, you know, okay, is this a one or is this a two? How would I categorize this horse? How would I assign a score to this horse? It can be very helpful. Um, but again, for horse owners, it's a really great tool too, just to keep track of your horse's health and condition. Um, another really exciting app that came out recently, the Animal Welfare um, Indicator Network, the AWIN group. This is um, Dr. Michaela Monero and, and her group out of Italy they have worked really hard to develop and validate a horse grimace scale app. The only thing about this app is currently it's only available through Google Play, so it's available for Android devices, but not yet available for um, iOS for, through, through iTunes. But it basically goes back to um, the one image that I showed you a few slides back. The Arabian horse that's having his foot worked on, he, he's clearly in, in some pain, experiencing some pain. They've validated using a pain model looking at um, horses that have been castrated with and without analgesic and, and non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs and, and also control horses that, that are not receiving um, both drugs but just sort of a, a sedation. And they can actually validate looking at the horse's facial expressions on a scale of basically one to five how much pain, you know, post-surgery or, or during the horse's recovery is that horse actually experiencing. And again, this can actually be something helpful for horse owners too, because if you have had a horse that's come home from the hospital, they are recovering, it might be a way for you to track and record how they're responding to treatment and, and to do their recovery process. Um, but again, from a welfare perspective, this is something really new that's come out, and it's, it's pretty exciting that we're able to use facial expressions to validate and, and to actually assess welfare. Um, another resource that, that we can probably give some of you guys access to if you're interested is this Guide to Equine Welfare Assessment. This is um, a, a document that was developed um, quite a few years back now, but it was really designed for 4-H leaders and 4-H and youth as a really fun and, and exciting activity that they could do even during the winter months um, when they're not actively out riding maybe as much, but something that they could engage in that talks about all the different indicators that we've, we've mentioned tonight, giving you some tools and some guidance on what is welfare, why is it important, how do you go about assessing that. It covers body condition scoring, it covers stress responses, looking at cortisol, heart rate, and so forth. Um, but it's available as a PDF document. This was something we developed at Michigan State University, um, and, and I think we'd be happy to share this with you if you guys are interested, especially if you have a role in educating youth, because I think it'd be a really neat, really fun activity for your youth. There's a couple websites that I just wanted to share quickly. Um, the American Association of Equine Practitioners has a, a part of their website devoted specifically to equine welfare. So they have everything from guidelines and white papers on very specific issues and, and situations. So they have welfare statements for um, 
carriage horses, for example, horses that work in urban environments. They have um, pretty specific and very useful resources on equine abuse, neglect, and abandonment. Um, both from kind of the equine rescues perspective, you know, how would you actually assess and make sure that equine rescues are having the resources that they need and, and finding the resources they need to provide um, good care for horses that have been abandoned or neglect, but also from the law enforcement side. Um, they have a, a PowerPoint that's available and some other resources that actually help those that are, are going out and reporting to neglect and abuse cases. Um, they also have equine welfare position statements, so again, as it relates to different disciplines or different types of horses, there's just a wealth of resources on there, and I find that, that very, very helpful. Um, and, and some of their work is a little bit more based on, on some of the science and some of the things that we're learning out of you know, equine welfare science, so that's, that's a good thing to, to have as a resource. The International Society for Equitation Science, this is an organization um, that has been, been conducting ongoing equine welfare research, um, behavior and welfare research for the last 10, 10 or so years. This is um, a multidiscipline, you know, several researchers from across the globe are involved in this society. Um, their website is, is also a really good resource. But essentially this, this group, this organization is concerned with the application of objective research and advanced practice to training and riding of horses. So the overall mission of Equitation Science, the International Society for Equitation Science, is to improve the welfare of horses in their associations with humans. So they are researching and, and looking at um, equine welfare from multiple avenues, multiple disciplines. So this includes learning theory, you know, understanding better how horses learn and how certain training methodologies affect or impact horse learning and cognition. They're looking at the behavior uh, or, or just nature and ethology of the horse. We look at biomechanics, um, psychology, and, and as well as sports science. So looking at the rider impact and, and helping riders um, interact better with their horses as well. I've also just left you with a few references. Um, these are some of the sources that I've used to, to put together the presentation this evening. Um, this article by Hawk and Hall is, is very interesting. This is an equine veterinary education article or review of approaches to assessing equine welfare. It talks a little bit more in depth and provides some additional resources on the five freedoms and several of the things that we discussed tonight as it relates to how do we go about assessing welfare. Um, the Guide to Equine Welfare Assessment is also listed there, Department of Animal Science, Michigan State University, and then the two papers that I, I shared with you this evening, um, the Ben Hajali and the Hosberger et al. looking on significance of adult play and foraging opportunities for horses and how that seems to be affecting welfare. So with that, um, I think I went a little longer than I wanted to, but I'm hoping that we can have at least a few minutes now for some questions and discussion. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to be with you this evening, and we'll be happy to take questions. So once again, um, to the participants, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, up at the top of your screen, you should see a link that says Q&A. And if you just click on that, you can go ahead and type in your question for Carissa and click on the Send button. Okay, I just received um, a question. What do you think is our greatest challenge in equine welfare today? That is an excellent question. I think one of the biggest challenges, um, I, I still feel like it's really, it, it can be very difficult, but very important to assess the concept of welfare that deals with the horse's effective state. So we know that, you know, we want to avoid fear and, and distress in horses, especially fear responses. We, we need to understand fear and pain and distress in horses better so that we can be extra careful that we're avoiding that in horses. Horses in terms of their behavior, that strong flight response that, that our domestic horses have, have held on to so well, 
um, you know, it had survival value to the horse. And so that's probably to this day what, what we see in terms of horse behavior that really influences a lot of their other behavior. If we, if we implement a, a training methodology or, or, you know, approach a horse or do something with a horse that elicits a fear response, it is so hard to then help that horse get over that fear response. Um, so I, I think understanding the horse's effective state is probably one of the biggest challenges. On the human side, I think one of the biggest challenges is the education component. Um, understanding welfare enough and being comfortable with it enough to engage in conversations and discussions with others, um, especially when people ask us questions, you know, depending on whatever discipline we're riding, if we're riding Western, if we have reining horses, dressage horses, eventing hunter jumper, um, all across the board in our equine industry, you know, there's certain practices that I, I think still get questioned. And so we're trying to do the research to better understand how the horse is responding to some of those so that we actually have more evidence and, and more useful information to say whether that really negatively or positively impacts the horse. And then we can make better judgments on that and, and help educate others. I hope that answered your question. Are there any other questions? Um, Chris, I see a question in here um, asking when the webinar will be available for viewing on our website. And um, I hope to have that up on our My Horse University website tomorrow. I would check um, late tomorrow afternoon. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I'll, um, I'm going to wrap up with a few things here. Carissa, if we still have some questions that come through, we can go back and answer them. Um, well, actually, let's pause for a second here. Oh, and Gwen, we just had a question. If we are interested in getting the 4-H publication, um, yes. will we be able to send that out to attendees, or should they contact us directly for access to that? Um, we've actually, um, Dr. Chris Skelly, who's on this webinar as well, helping to answer questions, she has actually already emailed someone um, to see if we can find where that publication is. So okay. um, if you're interested, I would suggest that you contact us at info at myhorseuniversity.com. Okay, excellent. And I'm going to put that email address right here in the response to raise question. And we might have a question from someone else here. Let's see here. Um, looks like there's one that was in our chat. Are you seeing that one, Carissa? Yes. Okay. I think that last question was maybe a compliment to Carissa on her um, fantastic presentation this evening. So that's wonderful. All right. So, um, Carissa, if you look forward to the next slide. Oh, yes. So as we're wrapping up here, of course, we'd like to thank um, Carissa for um, this wonderful talk this evening. Really appreciate that. And, Thank all of you as well for um, some of your questions here at the end. At the end of the presentation, we appreciate that as well. Um, all of you are gonna receive an email uh, shortly in the next couple days with an invitation to participate in an online survey. 
about tonight's webcast. And of course, your feedback is what helps us put together more of these webinars on topics that um, you know you really and topic areas that you are really interested in. So I have a URL for the webcast here, and I'm going to put it in the chat as well. So let me. There you go. So up at the top of your screen, you will see an option for chat. And if you go ahead and click on that, there should be an active link to this tiny URL um, right here. And it's a very short survey, just a few questions, and it would really um, help us out if you could take a minute to answer those questions. Let's get forward to the next slide, Carissa. Of course, also make sure to check us out on Facebook, both My Horse University and eExtension Horse Quest. Um, for up-to-date information about events, promotions, and more. And we will also be posting a link to our recording up on our Facebook page as well. So as mentioned earlier, I hope to have the recording up on our website by the end of the day tomorrow. And if you have any questions in the meantime, you can contact us at info at myhorseuniversity.com. And with that, unless there's any additional questions, I think we are good for this evening. Okay, thank you very much.